All right. Uh, hi, my name is Tatiana. And today I'm going to talk about uh, continuous integration or the ways how to do wrong with your continuous integration. I work at Wirecard and we are a global financial service and internet technology provider. Uh, we are present all around the world and here in Graz we are also taking important part of the development of the products we have. In my talk today I will talk about continuous integration uh, the common mistakes that can happen to you while using or configuring continuous integration, and I will talk a bit more about Jenkins, uh, which is a continuous integration server, and how you can do wrong with Jenkins. Uh, a bit about me, I work uh, in Wirecard as a software quality engineer. Uh, I work in a shop system team where we are developing plugins uh, for different kind of shop systems. I'm also quite interested about DevOps and automation, and I also love traveling. I have lived and worked in multiple countries, and now I'm happy to be based uh, here in Graz. So uh, why am I going to talk about continuous integration? Well, uh, as a QA, I think that quality assurance is a process of continuous investigation of the status of your product, and the CI is a great tool which can provide you an input at any time. And also, as I said, I worked in um, many countries before, and currently here in Graz, and I'm a part of cross-functional team. Uh, we are constantly trying new things, and uh, I have seen and done myself many good and bad decisions, uh, so I'd like to share with you some experience I had. Before I start, uh, a little disclaimer. Unfortunately, there is no silver bullet or a solution for all kinds of problems, so some things I will say are bad or are anti-patterns, can be probably the only solution which are available for your project or your team. And uh, yes, continuous integration goes hand in hand with continuous delivery, but I'm not going to talk about this today. So let's start. What is continuous integration? Well, it's a development practice uh, where developers uh, multiple times a day check in their code into a shared source repository. There is some automated build and test happening and that they're getting a result hopefully immediately. That allows you to easily retract steps back and figure out what was wrong in case of the error. There are many continuous integration servers available on the market. These are just some of them. Um, so yeah, if you're going to start and choose a continuous integration server, uh, it's worth to look around and uh, see what each of them brings. And that brings me to the next point, and main one thing that can happen to you is overcomplicated and uh, choosing some complicated solution when you can go for something simple. From my experience, for example, we had a project which was hosted on online GitLab, and instead of going for provided GitLab CI, which would allow us, with a couple of lines of Yammer code, have a ready solution with CI and CD running, we decided to host Jenkins ourselves, configure it, and run it. Uh, as a result, we spent a lot of time configuring things, maintaining things, and yes, just choosing a ready solution from GitLab would be much faster way to have the things running. If you are using GitHub, maybe Travis is the best solution for you. Also, with a couple of lines of YAML, you have things up and running. So what I'm trying to say is sometimes uh, hosting CI yourself uh, can cause you a lot of uh, time loss and maintenance. So if your project is quite simple and you don't need much resources, maybe it's uh, easy to go for a ready solution. Another thing that can happen um, is losing trust to your continuous integration. Uh, so on this picture, I'm trying to illustrate a pattern. Uh, so we had a build. It was green at some point, then it failed, and it continued failing for some reason. Uh, you can have builds failing not only because uh, you have actual bugs, but because you misconfigured something, you have tests which are flaky, or you have some errors in your build. Mm. Yeah, and if uh, it happens, uh, we are humans, so human psychology works the way that if you see something red and failing multiple times, you'll probably get used to it, and next time something fails, you'll not get alerted and be uh, as worried and try to fix it immediately. So as a result, you can really miss some important bugs or regressions or see them much later uh, than you could have seen them before. Also, you might start building locally because, yeah, that uh, CI server is stupid. It's always crashing. I'll just build it locally. And if you have some automated builds, 
uh, they are starting, but you're building locally, you just waste the resources you have. So trust is important to maintain, uh, and yeah, if you have some flaky tests, maybe get rid of them and don't run them uh, as your continuous integration build. And if you have any build errors or test errors, be alerted and fix them as soon as possible so your build is always green and nice. And if something fails, you immediately uh, see that there is an issue and you can fix it. Another thing uh, that can go wrong while using or configuring continuous integration is uh, dealing with notifications. So there is one extreme case, for example, you configure your CI and notification and it sends you an email for any reason, like build fails, build succeeds, something changed. Uh, you normally would probably make a folder in your email, filter all those emails there and never look at them. Another extreme case is uh, you don't have any notifications, so the only way for you to know that something went wrong is actually opening the page of your continuous integration server and looking. So yeah, if you don't do it regularly, you might miss something. So it's important to figure out with your team what is uh, the good amount of notifications for you. Uh, do you want them on when something fails or for any other reasons? Also, uh, it's important to figure out what is the good communication channel. Uh, for example, email may be not the best solution for everybody. People like Slack or HipChat or some other chats. Uh, an another great solution uh, is uh, visible dashboards. So if you have an extra screen in your office, good to have your CI results always on there. And also make sure your information that your notification brings is valuable, not just build failed, but maybe also some link, uh, where was that build, which stage was going on, and maybe some information about the error. Reporting comes hand in hand with notification and uh, here I wanted to uh, just highlight some uh, point that uh, developers and business people might want to see different information in the report. A developer will probably want to see some more technical information and some what happened in the error. A business analyst or manager will probably want to see a nice diagram with an overall status of the project. So if you are configuring reporting in your CI, think about that up front so your manager doesn't have to shoulder tap you all the time. He wants to know something, he can open a nice page in your CI and see uh, where the product is going and what's the status. Uh, scheduling is also not great if you're relying only on scheduling. So if you have nightly builds or some weekend builds, which are the only builds you have, it's not great. Because, for example, if you have a team of developers who are committing a couple of times a day and the build happens nicely uh, and nightly and something fails, uh, you come in the morning to the office and first of all you have to figure out who is the person who is going to look at the CI and uh, figure out what happened. You need to set up an extra process. Secondly, it will be much harder to find out what was the root cause of the error because there are many commits happened. Uh, yeah, a lot of layers of different code, so debugging might, might take longer time. Also, building only on developer's machine, uh, it's not great because you get in the situation, yeah, it works on my machine, you give it to a tester or to even worse, a client, and it doesn't work, that's a, a problem. So it's good to build it on some uh, neutral space, like a CI server, and yeah, you constantly know the results and you don't have to argue with a tester or a client that it works for me, it doesn't work for you. And if you're not building and testing at all, then you're definitely doing something really wrong. Another thing uh, which is important uh, when configuring and using continuous integration is security. Uh, different CI servers have different uh, security uh, problems or things you should pay attention to, so it's worth before you set up one to study what are the security implications and make sure you try to follow them. Uh, also, common mistakes is using some keys or credentials as plain text that they are seenable in the log, so make sure you don't do that. In Travis, for example, there are encrypted variables, in Jenkins there is credentials plugin. And the user control, so if you have some users who are not supposed to see or configure things, uh, don't let them do it, so configure the user control. So yeah, just simple Googling shows us that Jenkins is on the first place of the most uh, used continuous integration 
uh, servers. It happened also to me. Uh, I mostly use Jenkins in my career, so that's why I'd like to talk more about Jenkins further on. So what is Jenkins? Uh, it's an uh, open source continuous integration tool. It's written in Java, before it was called Hudson. Uh, it has a lot of plugins which cover a quite wide range of different use cases and functionalities, and it has a quite big community around it. So I want to illustrate a typical setup. Uh, maybe you have a different one, but this one is the most uh, you can see in the wild. So we have a master-slave architecture. We have a Jenkins master who is talking to Jenkins slaves, who can be any kind of uh, machine, like uh, Linux or Windows or Android. Master takes care of reporting, notifications, scheduling, uh, credentials, and slaves are actually the ones which are running your builds. Uh, when I just started uh, using Jenkins and actually my first experience with continuous integration, I was working in the team which was transferring from uh, Waterfall to Agile. We thought, yeah, let's try Jenkins. We configured it manually, didn't write too much documentation because it was uh, an experiment. So, and the, and, uh, the team started heavily relying on that and we had really nightmares that when we go home, what if our CI crashes tomorrow? We don't have any more CI, how will we spin it up? Uh, luckily, there is a solution for that. You can store most of the Jenkins, continue, uh, Jenkins uh, configuration as code. There is three main areas uh, where you can configure something in Jenkins. So first is the Jenkins infrastructure configuration, which is actually installing Jenkins itself on the master machine and the slave machines. There is a lot of tools for config management, there is Docker, Jenkins CLI. Uh, so, yeah, when you start with it, choose the one you like the most and go with it. Uh, for configuring Jenkins system, it's a bit more tricky. Um, you, that's the configuration which you need to do in uh, Jenkins itself, in the master, like configuring different plugins or credentials. Um, there is a nice plugin uh, called Jenkins Configuration as Code, where you write these things in YAML and also store them as code, and next time you don't have to do manual work. And the probably most important configurations for developers is configuring Jenkins jobs. And there is also uh, three possibilities. You can use the Jenkins Job DSL plugin and do it in Groovy. There is Job Builder plugin uh, in YAML. And uh, which is probably the most popular currently is Jenkins Pipeline plugin, where you write your jobs in Pipeline DSL. And uh, also there is a Jenkins Blue Ocean UI, uh, where you uh, write your jobs by clicking buttons in the UI, and it would store the job afterwards for you in the source control in the Pipeline DSL syntax, which I think it's quite a nice tool that you don't have to learn the syntax. Another problem uh, that can happen to you uh, and happened also to me, is multiple teams uh, using one master. So it can be an infrastructure decision or historical decision, but you end up with many teams using just one Jenkins master and relying on that. The problem with that is that when you reach a certain infrastructure bottleneck, you can have queues. Uh, you can also have teams arguing who is responsible, especially if somebody is blocking Jenkins with their tests or builds who are getting stuck. Uh, yeah, you have to figure out who's responsible, and if the last time it was not your team, next time you'll probably not look at your build and say, yeah, it's that team again blocking my builds. Uh, yeah, it loses also trust of your team to your CI because you constantly have to wait, and uh, you probably can start building locally again. And also, if you have multiple platforms where you're running your builds and tests, uh, it's hard to plan the resources, uh, which platforms are free, uh, if you don't have a very good monitoring or if the builds are stuck unpredictably, yeah, it's a problem for the team. Also, this can happen. Uh, different teams will start using different plugins. Some of them get deprecated. Some of them depend on other plugins. So sometimes uh, you install one plugin to help one team and you break something for another team. So as a result, uh, when we separated the Jenkins masters, things went much more smoothly because teams uh, started feeling responsible for their CI, having to look at it, uh, knowing that if something breaks, it's probably only their fault. Um, they started being able to schedule their jobs properly and think which platforms are available at which time. 
And also they started experimenting with reporting plugins and really taking the most of their CI server. Another thing which I think is not a great solution is having Jenkins master and slaves uh, running on one machine. So Jenkins allows to do that, but I think it's not the best decision because there is two main problems which can happen. Uh, first of all, uh, you can cross-contaminate your environments from different tests or builds, and the results might be not as clean and predictable. And secondly, if one of your builds and tests, for example, overuses a CPU, your whole Jenkins server goes down and you don't have CI for some time until you get it back up and running. So, yeah, luckily nowadays there is virtualization, at least, which you can use to split your builds and tests and, yeah, uh, have Jenkins master and slaves running at least in different VMs. Technical depth is not great uh, anywhere, also in using CI. Uh, for example, in Jenkins there is constant security updates, new plugins or plugin updates. So if you don't follow that and you don't have some regular maintenance intervals where you update some things, uh, you end up having this kind of Grandpa Jenkins. And once you update it, probably things will just go very bad and things will break. So you'll have to spend a lot of time to investigate what broke what and spin it back up. So uh, what is the new developments in Jenkins, or at least what the community is pushing hardly for, is uh, declarative pipelines and Jenkins Blue Ocean plugin, which is this. So it's, as I mentioned, as a UI for managing the pipelines, running them, configuring them. Um, yeah, and of course, there is a wide community constantly writing articles saying what's new and great. So it's good from time to time to follow up what's happening. Another thing uh, that can happen is that you can have one stage, or even worse, one script which does all your build and tests for you. That's not a good idea because, first of all, it might take long, and you will not know what exactly your CI is doing in a certain moment. And secondly, if it uh, fails, you have to look at the logs and figure out where it went wrong and how to fix it. So, yeah, it's much better to split your stages into logical steps, like build, unit test, uh, integration test, and so on, so you know what your CI is doing and where is it failing if something goes wrong. And another point, which is maybe unavoidable, unavoidable for some teams, is very long or running builds and tests. Sometimes it's really hard to know why, but I think it's really worth investigating uh, what is happening and why are your build and tests are taking so long and how to uh, minimize the time because this also loses your trust to the CI if you commit something and you have to wait for six hours till your build passes, probably something is really wrong. Sometimes the only solution is changing the architecture. Sometimes some multi-threading in tests help. It's really individual, but it's really worth looking at it. So as a summary, uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, there is no single solution for all the problems. And if you disagree with some points I mentioned today, feel free to come and talk to me after this talk. I would be curious to know how you are using your CI and what are the best solutions for you. Complicated things are bad, so uh, yeah, if you can make something easy, don't go for complicated things and try to keep things simple. Uh, make sure your team is participating in the choices you do with your CI uh, and then they will trust it more and participate uh, and look at the builds. Uh, yeah, trust is very important, so don't lose it. Keep your tests and run green. And of course, always automate, update and improve things when you can. So thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions. Yep. Can one slave only process one uh, script, one CI script at a time, or can they do multiple? Uh, it depends on how you configure it. It's all in your hands. So yes, you can have uh, one slave process, one script, and another slave process, another script. It's really how you configure your pipeline. So you need multiple slaves to process it, uh, parallel? No, you can you can use one slave to run all the processes if you run the scripts in a certain way because the CI is only the orchestrator so what is running on the machine and how it is running it's only up to you 
So you can use multiple slaves for different scripts. You can use one slave for many scripts in parallel. You can start a lot of Jenkins uh, processes on one slave. Okay, thank you. Yep. <laughs> uh, is the Jenkins slave talking to the master or the master talking to the slave? How is the communication? It's the master talking to the slave. So it's pushing information. But you can configure different protocols uh, when you connect the slave to the master and you can choose. So you, c you can be talking by SSH or by TCP IP. Okay. Yeah. yeah, if there's no more questions, then thank you very much. And I'll be around if you decide to ask something. Thank you.